If you get nervous when your phone is out of sight, you're an addict. If the very first thing you feel to do when you wake up in the morning and you still got one eye closed and you're tapping around trying to find your phone before you say your morning azkar, bro, you're an addict. If it's the last thing you look at before going to sleep, you're an addict. If you panic when you feel a buzz in your pocket and you really want to interrupt the conversation, but you don't want to seem rude, you don't want to see who messaged you, you're an addict. When, when you realize this, now without doubt, and it goes without saying, social media has brought with it so much good from an Islamic perspective, the ability to advertise a talk like this, record it, publish it, share it, allowing people from the four corners of the globe to benefit from it. The countless brothers and sisters who spend their evenings thinking about how to carefully craft that next Islamic reminder to help people find their way back to their religion. Thousands of people who found their way to Islam through social media. Quran that is recited, hadith that is promoted, misinformation that is corrected. La ilaha illallah. So much khair. And when someone does a good because of something you post, expect the same reward without any of their reward detracting. That's on one side of the spectrum, but on the other side of the spectrum, it has also brought with it a heap full of harms on the adults and on the children as well. Social media. A person's nightlife is quite ruined if you become obsessively addictive with social media. You can't sleep a proper full night anymore. These blue light emissions that you are absorbing all of the time, it affects your sleep rhythms. So you're knackered in the night, you can't sleep. And by day you're knackered because you haven't slept. And then your whole life becomes a misery. That's one thing. A second thing, think about your ability to be alone with Allah, alone with yourself. Young boys, young girls can't do that anymore. Because social media has, for the most part, removed that ability from us. Because every opportunity that you're not speaking to someone or working or doing something, it's an opportunity to put your hand in your pocket and to see what's going on, on the other side of the world. So you have no time for yourself. You lose the ability of finding contentment with just being alone. Number three, there's heaps of evidence now to prove beyond fact that some of the loneliest, saddest, most depressed and anxious people on planet Earth are those who use their phones, their social media specifically most. It's interesting, you think that the more friends you had online, the less lonely you feel. That's not the situation, that's not the science at all actually. Why? Because you are constantly comparing your life, your miserable or boring life that doesn't have vacations, doesn't have business, doesn't have the latest Jordans. You're comparing your life to the highlight reel of your neighbor, to the highlight reel of someone in Australia. And they've removed all of the blemishes and the flaws of their day. Number four, look at how social media has for many people made them completely socially incompetent, especially maybe the younger generation, Gen Z. They, they can't hold a long and deep and meaningful conversation with you looking at you eye to eye, that's gone. Because over the passage of years when you're obsessively using social media, what happens? Your mind now is hardwired and short-circuited to only be able to deal with short comments, LOLs, thumbs up, likes, hashtags, shares, and you lose the ability to become an interpersonal human being. You can't do it anymore. Social media teaches you that if there's a problem in your relationships, don't worry, you can just get out of it. Just click the blog button. End of story. Does that represent reality? Reality is far more sophisticated than that. So brothers and sisters, life is short. And life is precious. And only put your time and effort in that which will give you the greatest returns in the hereafter. And about the FOMO, the fear of missing out, don't worry, you're not going to miss out. You can walk away from social media if that's what you've decided to do and you've concluded that it's harming you, you can walk away and guess what? You'll live a little bit happier too. And you'll still be relevant. And you still know, what, you know what's going on in the news. And you'll still be relevant in the economy. And people still want to hire you as a professional. You're not going to miss out. You just might be a little bit happier and a little bit closer to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But with all of the common misconceptions, I do want to ask you about the concept of martyrdom in Islam. Okay. Basically, number one, martyrdom isn't just achieved through fighting. That's one thing. So there are various categories of martyrdom in Islam. Defending your property. If you died defending your property, you'd be considered a martyr in Islam. Hmm. If a woman died while giving birth, she would be considered a martyr in Islam. Um, 
If a person drowned in Islam, they're considered a martyr. If a person died of a stomach disease or some sort, they're considered. So there are various categories of martyrdom, right? But never should martyr, never is martyrdom equated with terrorism in Islam or killing someone that's innocent or hurting someone that's innocent. In fact, in Islam, there, there isn't this concept of, well, you know, if you've got a group of people that deserve to be killed, if you're fighting your enemy and you take out a hundred civilians as well, that it's fine. So <laughs> even the death of a woman in the battlefield, uh, in one of the battles that the Prophet Muhammad fought, peace be upon him, there was a woman that passed away from the other side and he stopped the entire army. He, he, he tried to find out who killed that woman that wasn't allowed. So if a person was to have been in that situation or is in a situation where they've defended something that's noble and they've died in something that's noble, there are lofty promises, it is the highest station of, of paradise and so on and so forth. But never does that mean search it out or seek it out. And that's why I mentioned the hadith, the saying of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, which is, don't ever wish to meet your enemy in a battlefield, don't wish for war. Uh, the first verse of the Quran is that fighting has been prescribed for you, but you hate it, even though you hate it. So uh, we're not meant to be a people that crave violence or that crave war. Um, but once a just war does take place, then certainly those noble men and, and women would be praised for, for their service and sacrifice. You look at my life. People might be looking and say, oh, what, what challenges does this guy ever face? He's living the life, as they say, right? That's not true. You would never, ever want to live my life. Not for a day. Trust me, not for a day. Allah gives everyone a certain capacity to take things. I remember one of our sheikhs, and I'm going to end on this note, I think. Uh, I have a bit more time? Inshallah. Okay, if you, a little bit more time, inshallah. Don't worry. Uh, one of our sheikhs said that a student of his came to complain. Sheikh, I have problems, big problems. So he was explaining exactly the way I was today to say,